Psalm 32. <coughs> I uh, call this psalm a uh, is happy are the redeemed. Happy are the redeemed. Those who are forgiven. Or we could say uh, happy that there's even forgiveness uh, at this point right now. That we are uh, that anybody, uh, that forgiveness is available to them um, when God knocks or calls on them and the Holy Spirit reveals to them their, their need uh, for a Savior. The title of this psalm uh, kind of, uh, tells us a couple of things. Uh, it's, it's a new title to us. This is the first time we've come across uh, this title. It says, uh, A Psalm of David, which is... Um, so far, majority of all of our songs has been uh, accredited to David. Uh, he's been, uh, it's saying that he has wrote about 73 of the Psalms. And so that's no, that's no uh, shocking there. But this particular title associated or tagged on called A Contemplation uh, is a new one. This is a new title. Now, the Hebrew word used there instead of contemplation is maskil. And what this does is, uh, this is uh, there are 13 uh, psalms uh, given this title of maskil, or con to contemplate. And so this being the one of the first. It means, uh, contemplation means to, to carefully consider, right? It's to... Uh, to view or to observe, to meditate on, to, to really think about. But my skill means a, something a little bit different. It's, it means, in a nutshell, to enlighten. And so it is a psalm to teach us something. It's a psalm that, uh, that sheds a knowledge or light on something. And what David is wanting us to see in this psalm is the... the, uh, the the benefits of forgiveness, of when you, are, when you know that you are not in the right relationship with a holy God, when you realize or you come to that point in your life that you know that we or, or that I know that I'm putting something else in front of a holy God, something that he does not want us or want me to be a part of or to do. And when you come to that point in your life and you ask that forgiveness, you confess that sin, and then he forgives you, David goes through that process in these 11 verses of Psalm chapter 32. It's a psalm that means um, that will provide to us the knowledge of how God will forgive us if we are honest and open with him, and he will en enlighten us or he will forgive us. Uh, it's not just words on a page. Uh, the, we could also uh, contribute this, uh, this contemplation or maskil to the entire Bible, couldn't we? The, the, the entire Bible is full of knowledge that teaches us how to live our life uh, worthy of him. This psalm is going to teach us about um, the forgiveness provided to any sinner, anyone, and we're all sinners. Some saved by grace, some hadn't been saved yet. But we're all sinners, the Bible says. And it is providing that sinner who bows that knee uh, before a Savior and asks uh, for his mercy and his grace to be bestowed upon him. And God hears that. Prayer. He, know, he knows that person's heart, and he answers that prayer. It's about being able to trust, too. David learned to trust God. David learned that he could trust God, that, that God was faithful all the time, even in the times when maybe David was not living his life as God would have him to live. But yet, God heard his voice, and God... Uh, directed his path into responding with, first of all, asking to be forgiven of those sins. So he's, it's about being able to trust God, to be honest with him, to be open with him, because, one, he knows all things already. So it's, we might as well 
let's just be honest with God about what really is bothering us, what really is hindering us or in our walk with him. Jesus told a, the, the parable of the lost son. You remember that when, when the lost son asked for his inheritance and he went off and it said he squandered all his living and he, he lived like he wanted to live, but there was a time when he came into his life that he realized that he had sinned against his father. That's what he said. I have sinned against my father and his house, and I'm going to go back to him, and I'm going to ask for his forgiveness and to be a servant of him. And so he went back, and he was walking down that road, and you know that the father, it says, saw him coming, and he went running to him. And he, he, told, he confessed his sin to his father, but then the father did something. Not only did he forgive him of his sin, but he did something else that the son did not expect the father to do. And that's what God does for you and I. When we come to him and we ask him to forgive us of our sins, he does something else that we did not expect him to do. One, he takes away the shame of our sin. He takes away the shame of our sin. He takes away the shame of our guilt. And he puts a robe on us and a crown on us. And he calls us his child. We become the adopted children of God. That's something that's unexpected. But that's what he does. That's what that parable, to me, shows. That the father went beyond just forgiving someone of their sins. He went beyond that, and he gave them a purpose uh, in their life. He gave them a, a place, a home. And that's what he does for us. When God, the father, redeems us, he not only wipes away our sins, but he removes the guilt and he removes the shame. So let's look at what uh, David has to say uh, in Psalm 32. And I'm, we're just going to read the verses as we uh, go along. The first two verses are the, uh, that David begins with. He begins with blessed. Uh, verse 1, blessed is he whose transgression is forgiven, whose sin is covered. Blessed is the man to whom the Lord does not impute iniquity, and in whose spirit there is no deceit. Matthew uh, chapter 5, uh, 3 through uh, 11, uh, Jesus uh, uses that same word, uh, blessed, in the Sermon on the Mount, he begins his Sermon on the Mount with, in verse 3, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be what comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be filled. Blessed are the merciful for they shall obtain mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. And blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when, you, when they revile and when they persecute you and say all kinds of evil against you falsely, for my sake. And I think all of us can, can see that, that in David's life. Those who persecute you and say revile things about you. Jesus said, you will see, you will experience, you will make it into heaven. Blessed uh, is also the same word that uh, David used in his very first psalm that we studied in Psalm 1, 1, Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor stands in the path of sinners, nor sits in the seat of the scornful. 
Blessed who chooses not to follow the path of this world, but follows the path of God's world, God's kingdom. So blessed is the man. Happy is another is what that word means. Happy is that man. You know, Jesus preached in his Sermon on the Mount about this happiness that we just read, and, and we learned that it is not found in the things of this world. Happiness is not found in the things of the world. Not that all things are bad, but they, are, they don't last. They, they, are, they are not going to make it uh, in the end. It, those things are going to be done away with. But they're just like the manna in heaven. That manna, yes, it was a blessing to the children of God, to, to, to the people of God, while they were walking through the wilderness, but it was something that would not last. It would not sustain them for eternity. There had to be something else to come to make that an eternal blessing, to make it last forever. It was only to sustain them, to get them through. And those are the things that this world, that God has given us in this world, it's not to last forever, but it is to sustain us, to get us through while we are serving Him on this earth. But one day, we're going to make it to heaven. And it's going to be everlasting. And it's going to be a permanent change. Jesus preached about this happiness. And you are not going to find happiness in the materialistic things of this world because they will go away. Happiness only comes when we are living in the center of God's will. And this is what David is talking about in these first two verses. He, had, he was not at this point at, at, at one time, and we're going to get to that in a minute. But for, for in the end, he was happy. He was happy. When we learn to love the things that the Lord loves and hates the things that the Lord hates then we will start experiencing the blessedness and the blessings of God and, uh, in our life. We will start experiencing those things. David said, blessed is the man whose transgression is forgiven, or happy is the man whose transgression is forgiven. In other words, whose heart is in tune with God's heart. It says that David says his transgressions were forgiven. You know, in the Old Testament, we see a lot of this. We see three words that all deal with sin. Transgression, here's our first one. His sin is one, and iniquity is one. All three of those are mentioned in the first uh, two verses. Transgression is basically our rebellion. Transgressions, David is saying... Blessed is the man or happy uh, is the man who God forgives him of his rebellious spirit, his rebelliousness. Uh, those things are, are when, that he does against uh, God's uh, will. And he also talks about uh, how his sin uh, in a minute was covered. But God said, David said, he forgave me of my transgressions. And this forgiveness means to, to carry away, to carry away. When we ask God to forgive us of our sins, in other words, God takes those sins and he carries them away from us. The Bible says, what does he do with them? It says he carries them away. And he throws them as far as the east to the west or into the deeps or depths of the deepest ocean. And as somebody once said, not only does he throw it into the deepest ocean, but he sets up a sign and says, no fishing. So he, he throws those sins and those transgressions away so that they will not be remembered. He does not, he chooses not to remember those sins and hold them against us but David goes on and says not only does he he uh, take my sins away he he uh, carries my sins away but he also covers my sin whose sin is covered 
concealed, hidden. See, that's what, that, that's what he's saying. It's, it's to not be seen again. Not to be held against us again. It's a, it's a picture of the, uh, the atonement when, when the uh, high priest would, would sacrifice the, the uh, animals and, and they would take the blood and he would go into the holies of holies and he would sprinkle the blood over the mercy seat. The blood was covering the sins of the people. And that is what Jesus has done for all of us. When he sacrificed himself on that cross, not only did he die for all, and I believe all sin, his blood covered that. It, he wiped that debt clean as far as God was concerned. We have to accept that gift in order to receive the benefits of what he did for us on that cross. It's what, it's what that picture uh, means. So verse 2 says... Not only does he carry our sins away and he uh, hides those sins against us, it says, Blessed is the man who the Lord does not impute iniquity and whose spirit there is no deceit. Impute. Impute, impute is an accounting term. When you impute something, it's to charge your account with. You've been charged your, your account with. Now, we all had a, uh, an account uh, that, as far as God was concerned, uh, it was not pretty. It's a sin debt that none of us could ever pay. No matter how good we think we are, no matter how many good deeds we think we have ever done, no matter how kind and nice we have always been to our neighbors, it's a debt between you and God, not your neighbor, not your friend, that we could never pay. It's, a, it's, a, it's an expensive, it's an, um, a massive debt. Now that debt can be uh, imputed on us. That's when he says my, my, iniqui or my transgressions um, or, or my iniquities were not imputed on me. It's God is not going to hold me accountable for them. That's what he's saying. That God is not going to come to a point... And, or he, he didn't in David's uh, time here, and say, you are responsible for this debt. I'm calling you out. I'm calling you forward do, uh, to pay for this debt. And if you can't pay for the debt, then you have to suffer the consequence. And it is not live in eternity with God, but in eternity without him. That's the penalty for that debt. Each and every one of us Walk, that's ever walked this earth has had that debt. David realized that he had sinned against the Lord and which led him to cry out to the Lord for forgiveness of his sin and, as, and the Lord, it says, heard him and covered his sin and did not impute the iniquity on him. Happy is that person. David is happy. He's joyful. He's excited that the Lord chose not to hold him accountable. But do you know there's a, there's a story that Jesus tells in Luke uh, chapter 12, verse 20, and I didn't give this to Rob, but that's okay. It's the parable of the rich fool. Do you remember what he said? In, in this parable that this person, he had a plenty. He says, the ground of a certain rich man yielded plentifully. And he thought within himself, what shall I do since I have no room to store my crops? I will do this. I will pull down my barns, build greater ones. And there I will store all my crops and my goods. And I will say to my soul, Soul, you have many good laid, goods laid up for many years. Take your ease. Eat, drink, be merry. But then verse 20 says, But God said, Fool, this night your soul will be required of you. This soul 
your account is going to be pulled up and your iniquities are going to be imputed onto you. Do you have what it takes to solve, to take care of this debt? If we stand before a holy God and, God, and Jesus' blood has not covered our sins, we will not have what it takes to pay the debt. That man so was required of him that night. This is what David is talking about in verse 2. He is happy. That did not happen to him. He was given opportunity to, for, uh, to ask forgiveness and it was granted to him. And he was happy. Nonetheless, he should be, right? The Lord treats David as if he has not never sinned. That's amazing. He treats us that way as well. Forgiveness of sin produces happiness. And God treats us as if we had never sinned. Verses 3 through 5. When I kept silent, my bones grew old through the groaning all the day long. For day and night your hand was heavy upon me. My vitality was turned into drought of summer. I acknowledged my sin to you and my iniquity I have not hidden. I said I will confess my transgressions to the Lord and, your, and, your, and you forsake the, uh, forgave the iniquity of my sin, Selah, verses 3 through 5. <coughs> David begins to shed a little light on uh, the effects of sin in his life, the effects of the unforgiven sin that was going on in his life. He begins to show us first, he said, I kept silent. I kept silent. And a lot of us like to do that, don't we? That's like that's mistake number one. We, uh, as far as our uh, communication with God, we keep silent with Him. We hope that this thing is going to pass us by, but it don't. We hope this sin is not going to be uh, found out, and so we try to cover it up so no, no one will know, so that God won't know. But what happens when we do that? What happens when we try to keep silent about our sin? David says, my bones grew old. My stability began to weaken. I was not able to stand on my own two feet. My sin was getting so heavy that it was starting to break me down physically and emotionally, spiritually, all of it wrapped up. My sin was overwhelming me and it was overtaking me and I was not going to last if something wasn't to happen. My sin was not going to pass me by. He said that that weight of his sin was so bad that it caused his bones to be weak. He was shaking. He could not stand. He was losing stability. He, his sin was eating him alive like a, like a disease. He goes on in verse 4 and says, for, for day and night, he says, your hand was heavy upon me. Day and night your hand was heavy upon me. You know one thing, uh, what this tells me? The hand of God who weighs heavy on a person day and night must be a child of God. Because the Bible tells me only God chastises his children. God chastises his children. He doesn't chastise children that are not his. Jesus said, I don't come to condemn the world. Why? Because they're already condemned. I don't have to do that. They're already condemned. I came to, to save those who are sick, who are lost. And when we accept God as our Lord and Savior, the Bible says if we're not walking in, in, in with Him and doing the things that He uh, is doing with Him, He will chastise us. I believe that's what we see in here. The heaviness of His hand will weigh against us. He is going to keep um, pounding us and pounding us until we come to our senses and we uh, ask Him to forgive us so that we can move on. 
as children of his. David was not able to rest. That's what he was saying. He was being chastised. David says that the sin in his life was drying him up. He says, my vitality was turned into the drought of summer. It was drying me up like a, like a desert, like I was out in the desert with no water. Uh, I'm thirsty. My body is, uh, is, is wanting thirst, wanting water. I'm like a plant out here in the middle of the desert who just dries up to nothing and withers away. This is what... Uh, David is saying about this sin in his life. It just wants some little petty sin that David is referring to. It's something uh, heavy on him, and it's causing him pain. It's causing him to suffer. Hebrews 12, 5 through 6, it says, And you have forgotten the ex exhortation which speaks to you as to sons. My son, do not despise the chastening of the Lord, nor be discouraged when you are rebuked by him. For whom the Lord loves, he chastens and scourges every son whom he receives. I guess that's like, you know, when our parents used to, my, used to uh, whoop me or something, and they say, well, this hurts me more than it hurts you. <laughs> we said, that's not right. <laughs> Well, that's what the Lord does. It hurts us more. It hurts him more than it hurts us. He loves us, and he wants the best for us, and he is not, I thank God, he is not going to allow me to fail. When I put my life, uh, give him my life, and I put my trust in him, he's not going to allow me to fail. Not that I'm going to be perfect the rest of my life either, but he's going to see to it that I make it in the end. Verse 5, David says, I acknowledged, I acknowledged my sin to you and my iniquity. I have not hidden. I said, I will confess my transgressions to the Lord. And it says, and you forgave the iniquity of my sin. There again, the three words are sin, iniquity, transgression. I said, Transgression was the rebellionist. The sin is not miss, is missing the mark, right? For the wages uh, for all have sinned and fall short of glory. God, God, that's missing the mark. Not standing up or, or, or uh, being able to stand up against the the criteria or the uh, things that God would have us to be like. But the iniquity that is the perversiveness of sin. That is the deliberate act. The del you're deliberately not living according to the way God will have us to live or going against his word. That's a deliberate act against God. And David said, you forgave me of all of this. You forgave me. I've confessed all of this, and you forgave that to me. That's why he can be happy in verses 1 and 2. I acknowledge my sin. I confess uh, my sin to you. I did not hide them because I knew I can't. I can't hide my book. My life is an open book. You remember the uh, uh, someone else tried to hide their sin from God all the way back into the garden. We go back to the garden. What did Adam and Eve do? Genesis three, verses eight and ten. It says, and they heard, Adam and Eve that is, they heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And, and Adam and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. Then the Lord called to Adam and said to him, where are you? So he said, I, I heard your voice in the garden and I was afraid because I was naked and I hid myself. See, they tried to hide their sins from God. They tried to cover them up themselves. And David is saying, we can't do that. We can't try to hide our sins from God. He knows our sins. He knows everything about us. He knows where we hi our hiding places are. We never can hide from that. 
but confess them and he will cover them. He will carry them away never to be remembered again. And then verse 6. For this cause everyone who is godly shall pray to you in a time when you may be found. For this cause. For what cause? What is David talking about? For what cause? For the cause of, of asking for forgiveness. For, for the cause that if we are open and honest uh, with our God, that he will cover our sins. And when that happens, we will become that blessed man or that happy man, that happy person who knows that they had transgressed against God but who have now been forgiven. For this reason, David says, I write, if any are godly and want to experience the forgiveness that he experienced, then we must pray to the Lord while he can be found, while there is forgiveness available. Now is the time, the Bible says, for salvation. Right now. In our time that we're in our time period that we're in right now. Which I think also implies that there may there is going to come a time when it will be too late. There will come a time when when confession will not be heard. And that's when he comes back in the end. So call now, David says. Talk to the Lord now while he uh, can be found. Verse 7, you are my hiding place. You shall preserve me from trouble. You shall surround me with songs of deliverance. The Lord, and, uh, uh, the Lord became David's hiding place. That's like protection, his, his abode. Um, it's, it's his refuge. The same word that we've, been, we've talked about in other psalms. The Lord is his refuge. It's his, he's his protector. He guards his soul. He guards his mind. We can, we can use that the armor of God that Paul talks about uh, for that uh, too. He can guard our soul. He can guard our minds. You shall preserve me uh, from trouble well in other words you shall deliver me you shall uh you surround me uh with songs of deliverance you put a song in my heart uh the the forgiveness in other words uh births worship the forgiveness from god causes david to worship uh to want to instruct others to tell others uh about him the Lord saved David from his sin and protected him from the shame and the guilt. And now he is being surrounded by songs of deliverance. And he's singing joyfully uh, to the Lord because of that. Which leads us to verse 8 and 9. Some uh, say 8 and 9 are David's continuation of instructing uh, those that are around him. Instructing them based on his personal experience that he had uh, with the forgiveness of God. Some believe that it's actually um, what the Lord said back uh, to David. That it's the Lord saying, and I will instruct you and teach you in the way you should go. And I will guide you with my eye. Either one could work. Either one would, would be okay. In verse 9, it went on and says, Do not be like the horse or like the mule, which, will, which have no understanding, which must be uh, harnessed with a bit and bridle, else they will not come near you. It could be either one. But what if we kind of look at it? It was the, the Lord speaking to David the Lord is reminding David he will teach him the way 
that he should go. I will direct your path. I will be with you night and day, just like he was in the wilderness. I will, uh, I will be with you everywhere you go. See, we, uh, we, are, we are blessed uh, because now that happens. The, when we accept Christ as our Lord and Savior, the Holy Spirit is, indwells in us. He's, he lives inside of us. So he is with us everywhere we go. He's di- he can direct us if we listen to him or if we ignore him like uh, we ignore Siri. We know what's best. You don't tell me what to turn. <laughs> I turn when I get good and ready. See, when the Holy Spirit is speaking to us like that, we, we sometimes do that, don't we? We sometimes treat him like that. We know what's best. We have a shortcut that we're wanting to take. And God says there is no shortcuts when following me. It's all or nothing, right? The good and even the bad. Because it's during those tough times, it's during those trials like David is experiencing here that God develops him and and causes him to grow and it causes him to have strength. To learn to look at God in a different way. The Lord will instruct him and lead him. But David has to follow, not lead. He has to follow the Lordship, his Lordship. And we have to do the same thing. The Lord went on and said, don't be stubborn like that horse and like that mule. Don't be stubborn-minded. Commit yourself to me and my word, and I promise I will be with you. I will direct your path. Psalm 119, 105, your word is a lamp unto my feet and a light to my path. Yeah, that's what God's word does uh, for you and I. And then lastly, verses uh, 10 through 11, make sorrow, many sorrows shall be, To the wicked. But he who trusts in the Lord, mercy shall surround him. Be glad in the Lord and rejoice. And you righteous, and shout for joy, all you upright in heart. David says, For those who choose to be stubborn, you're going to miss out. If you choose to be stubborn, You're not going to experience the mercifulness and the blessedness of God. You're going to miss out. But if you trust in the Lord and you continue to trust in the Lord, no matter what, then you will experience his mercy in your life. You will experience the blessedness in his life. You will experience the forgiveness of sin when you confess them uh, to him. We'll be glad in the Lord. We will rejoice in the Lord. And there will be joy in our hearts. Ain't that something that we'll be able to joy uh, in the midst of our sorrows. We can still learn to have joy uh, in the Lord when we recognize Him and for what He done. Jesus just like David, he was happy because he experienced that forgiveness. And Jesus came to die, the ultimate death. There is no more sacrificing year after year anymore. There was one sacrifice, and Jesus offered his body and his blood to cover all of our sins, to cover all of our iniquities, and to cover all our transgressions so that we can live for him. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for this psalm. Thank you for reminding me, first of all, Lord, that I need you every day, that I need your guidance and I need your direction every day. There will never be a time in my life while I'm on this earth that I will never not need you. 
And may I always remember that. May I let your light uh, shine that you have placed in each and every one of us. You said you have called us out to be the light of the world. You are the light of the world, but you called us to be the light and the salt of this world. May we never hide it, but cause it to shine so that your light can draw others to you, so that others may can see us live a life that's pleasing unto you and cause them to want what we have. Maybe we ready all the time to give an account for what we have in our life and for what you have been doing in our life. May we always be ready to give that word, that testimony, be that witness. In your holy name we pray. Amen.